report on a journey to the western states of North America and a stay of several years along the Missouri during the years 1824 to 1827 by Gottfried Duden. 19th letter, part 2, written in May 1826. Number 28. Also, are there not incidents in Europe when the most barbarous criminals endured all degrees of torture and met death with unshakable defiance? Do we not find similar characteristics among beasts of prey? A passion that borders on madness makes man resemble these animals more closely. How may one speak of spiritual fortitude in connection with such paroxysms? to restrain the tendency toward pride, toward vengeance, and toward passionate defiance, has always been the primary task of a good education. Among the Indians, the opposite is true. They seek to attain their greatness by inflexible nurturing of these tendencies. European youth has the same predisposition toward such Indian greatness, and it certainly would not be difficult to develop it fully. The best travel reports agree on this matter. I recall only John Carver, Volney, Romans, Old Mixon, and La Perus. They declare the Indians to be extremely frivolous, inconsistent, and also arrogant. They say their pride is easily incited to cruelty making them bloodthirsty and implacable. It is especially worth reading what Leperos, in his account of the unfortunate incident near the Friendly Islands, writes about the Indians and the enthusiastic bias of one of his companions toward them. I am not speaking here of the treatment that the Indians suffered from the first conquerors, such an indictment can be applied in general to all people of this earth who have everywhere and at all times been guilty of atrocities. I am speaking of the manner in which the Indians are being treated by the United States. Slavery is out of the question. On the other hand, if the measuring rod of moral values is applicable also to the Indians, then all evils that have resulted from associating with citizens of the United States must seem negligible in comparison with the good, especially in comparison with the effect of the abhorrence that every European, not excepting the crudest hunters and frontier traders, feels concerning the above-mentioned faults. A collection of individual incidents has little weight for one who knows the exaggerations and distortions and the credulity of fanatic anecdote collectors. It is not difficult in this manner to have every people on this earth appear as offsprings of hell. Careful observation of human nature itself, and of the source of information, is the primary prerequisite for criticism. That more could be done to further civilize the Indians does not justify a disregard for what is actually being done. Europeans should not take the trouble to offer advice to the United States concerning the promotion of the welfare of mankind. I should think that a mere glance at the need for it at home would deter the friend of his own country from this. It has long been the endeavor of the United States to influence the Indians to adopt permanent homes and the steady cultivation of the soil. This is the indispensable condition of culture. Some tribes have already adopted this way of life and now realize what they owe to their white brothers. If the Indians are constantly decreasing in number, the United States has no cause to blame itself. The real reason can be found in their way of life and in their constant feuds. These feuds start mostly over hunting. This is not hard to understand if one considers how easily the pursuit of game in Europe where in general it is only a sport, leads to border crossings and ensuing violent quarrels. For Indians, hunting is their sustenance, since they abhor the breeding of cattle and farming. At most, they have their women and children, cultivate small gardens. To speak of the rights of a few persons to the exclusive possession of large areas is just as ridiculous as to complain 
about the increase in numbers of whites. The good sons of the forest Indians would thereby be restricted in their hunting grounds and perhaps even be forced to make use of several of the millions of Morgan of fertile soil to raise grain or for pastures in order to escape the pangs of hunger. The reasons that move the United States to buy the land from the Indians have nothing to do with the conviction that the Aborigines have a sacred right to it. In immeasurable expenses, such acquisitions have not even caused an irksome restriction, not to mention dispossession. The United States acquires only such areas as are used by the Indians solely as hunting grounds. The few tribes that engage in agriculture are spared even the suggestion of selling. In order to protect the Indians from fraudulent greed, private citizens have been denied any direct acquisition of their land. Even the individual states no longer possess this right. The federal government has reserved for itself the exclusive right, and its execution is directed on the basis of principles for which no civilized people on this earth need be ashamed. What the situation is at present concerning the affairs between the state of Georgia and the Creeks I do not know. But one must feel no concern that the national government will ignore those principles in this matter. It is incredible how vehemently some German publications criticize the treaties of the national government with the Indians, as if the moderate procedure of the United States had any similarity with that of our honored ancestors who founded their rise to power upon the downfall of all old nations of Southern and Middle Europe. You must not expect me to describe in detail the mode of life of the Indians, as innumerable reports already exist about it. However, I must mention that I have seen true Kalmuk faces among them, faces in which the cheekbones not only projected but also seemed to be pressed upward, so that the outer corners of the eyes also seemed to be pushed upward, and the slits of the eyelids, instead of forming a horizontal line, converged downward. In general, I was reminded of the Asiatic warriors who appeared in Germany in 1813 and 1814. Even the color of the skin seemed to me more yellow than red with sun. Another point, which perhaps is less well known, is that some tribes eat no salt at all, despite the fact that they exist almost entirely on meat. They maintain that eating salt impairs free breathing. 